Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon session of the Compass Conference on Religion and National Identity. Uh, I'm sorry, on Religion and the State. Uh, the panel you're about to hear is titled Religion and American National Identity by a very distinguished uh, lineup of guests. Uh, my name is Erica Gilbray. I'm an associate professor in political science here at Ohio State. And I'm also the coordinator, when I decided to work coordinate, not director or anything like that. I'm the coordinator of the Compass Program on Religion and Public Life. So I've helped make this event happen, but I've had many helpers um, along with me. I'm going to leave it to our moderator, my colleague, uh, Corey Edwards, in the Department of Sociology, introduce our panelists. Um, but please join me in welcoming our guests for this session of Religion in America and National Identity. Well, welcome, everybody. Super excited to be here. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're just going to start off with Sam and Sam and I. Uh, they're really kind of the headliners, and I'll, I'll, I'll offer a few comments. We're going to be speaking each, and we're between like 12 and 20 minutes, and then we really want to engage into some great discussion. So I hope you have a lot of comments and ideas and thoughts as we are speaking today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go out and start off introducing uh, Sam Hazelby. I had a great opportunity to speak with him uh, yesterday over the phone, got to know him a little bit, as well as Tisa. Uh, Sam earned his PhD in history at Columbia University. He was elected a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows from uh, 2007 to 2010. Uh, Sam also taught American Studies and History at American University of Beirut and the American University of Iowa for four years before returning to the U.S. to work in journalism, which is a large part of what he does now. Uh, he has his book um, out called The Origins of American Religious Nationalism. And it's been widely reviewed, and I'm super excited to hear more about that. Now he's a senior editor at IM Magazine. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Thank you, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, uh, everybody at Ohio State for who's been involved in putting this together. Um, I want to thank the full house, this is wonderful, on a Friday afternoon. Uh, it speaks very well of the curiosity and, and the energy of the Ohio State uh, students and faculty. Um, but I'm very happy to be here. It's an honor to be included among such distinguished panelists and commenters. Uh, and uh, I am going to make an effort uh, in the spirit of form as well as substance uh, to keep this to under 15 minutes, uh, and, and then um, <clears throat> we can uh, hopefully have more questions or discussion uh, as events run their course. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk about three, three things very quickly here, about five minutes or so on each. Uh, the first one, since, since um, it, it does speak to, to uh, uh, questions of America and religious and religion and national identity, um, <clears throat> uh, why America is not a Christian nation. Um, this is something that uh, there's a surprisingly low level of conversation around, uh, given what seems to me like a fairly easy problem to solve. Um, and I'll, I'll quote something. If anybody can tell me where this quote is from, I'll be super impressed. Um, the quote is, they have deluged your country in blood and idolatry. Does anybody recognize those words? Osama bin Laden? Almost! The Continental Congress! Thank you, sir. That was always beautiful. Huh? <laughs> that was the Continental Congress in 1775, speaking of what religion? Anybody, anybody over a certain age, I uh, don't want to embarrass me, should, should be able to, to name this one. It wasn't Islam, right? It was Catholicism. It was Catholicism. Um, if you want to find esteemed public officials <clears throat> saying really horrible things about a world religion, um, just go to the 18th or 19th century in this country and, and find uh, a look for, for comments that uh, leading members of the American political and intellectual class said about Catholicism. Um, that was the Continental Congress describing 
their objections. They deluged, they said island, I'm sorry, I said country. They deluged your island in blood and idolatry. Um, that was the Continental Congress uh, objecting to the British Parliament uh, about their granting of equal citizenship to the people of Quebec uh, in 1775 because uh, for reasons that will be immediately familiar to any sort of sentient citizen of the world today and that were discussed in different, somewhat different form in our panel this morning, um, Catholics were of course incapable of being Americans uh, and Catholicism was of course incapable uh, with Americanism. Um, so uh, the, the, this was a, a not, by no means a universal sentiment in 18th and 19th century America, but it was astonishingly astonishing by sort of conventions or uh, 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 premises of um, and mis false ideals, ideas of uh, American the history of American toler religious toleration and liberalism. Uh, it was very open and very common. Um, <clears throat> ask any American Catholic over the age of 70, uh, and they can tell you about it, I'm sure. Uh, one of the interesting things about it is that it's completely collapsed uh, after being a kind of organizing principle of American political life for about 300 years. Uh, you tell people that anti-Catholicism today, and it just sounds like it's coming from another planet. It's like, really? Why are they not like Catholics? <clears throat> um, but my point that I want to make is that uh, the American, the United States, the American nation state, uh, was in some real ways, uh, founded as an anti-Catholic country. Most Christians in the world were Catholics. I think that's still true, I'm not sure. It certainly was true then. Um, so right away you have a problem with calling the United States a Christian country. How can a country founded in opposition to the most popular form of Christianity in the world be a Christian country? Um, it can't. Uh, not, not in any kind of <clears throat> simple way. And then you could um, just kind of devolve to Protestantism and say, oh, well, then it was founded as a Protestant country, right? They, 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 meant, they meant Protestant. <clears throat> um, okay. But the problem with that is that uh, Great Britain was a Protestant country. Um, Great Britain was not only a Protestant country, Great Britain was the Protestant country. Uh, rebelling against Great Britain to found a Protestant country would be somewhat like rebelling against Wall Street in the name of capitalism, um, uh, rebelling against the Vatican in the name of Catholicism. <clears throat> uh, in no simple or direct sense uh, can, can one uh, say that the United States was founded as a Protestant country either. We start to get very quickly into the <coughs> convoluted and sectarian meetings of what Protestant <coughs> might possibly mean that only would be meaningful to certain kinds of sectarian Protestants. <coughs> um, so, uh, and I, I bring this up because there's a couple different constituencies that uh, entertain this debate. Uh, I don't think it's one that's easy to, to uh, <coughs> dismiss, though, and it shouldn't hold us up for too long. Um, you could say, when I taught in Cairo, I asked my students sometimes, as a matter of course, do you think the United, you think the United States is a, is a Protestant country, or is a Christian country? And they said, yeah, of course. So, um, so they, they had not but obviously that was a different, um, their perception of it and what they meant by that was quite different. Um, <clears throat> as I was discussing it last night with uh, Chad and Hamid and, and, and others at dinner, the um, really one of my kind of writerly and intellectual heroes, Marilyn Robinson, a great novelist who's written a series of absolutely wonderful novels about Protestant intellectual life in the American Midwest, uh, has written also two essays about why, uh, why she calls the U.S. a Christian country. Um, and as much as I respect and revere Marilyn Robinson, I, 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 I think she's I have to disagree with this, or, or say that it's only meaningful in some almost meaningless kind of demographic sense, uh, kind of like saying uh, the Earth is an Asian planet because most people on it live in Asia. Uh, okay, so that's true, right? But that's not very interesting or important. Um, so uh, why then, um, why, why then, 
this question, and what I want to do is link this question of Catholicism and anti-Catholicism and, and Islam and anti-Islam. Um, I want to link them to, I think, what, what the underlying question is, which is uh, the question of American nationality and American nationalism. Um, I don't think that I don't think that, uh, historically speaking, um, anti-Catholicism in America had really anything to do with Catholicism. Uh, just like I don't think that anti-Islam or Islamophobia or whatever one wants to call it in America today has really much of anything to do with Islam. Um, and there's evidence for this. Um, one is that anti-Catholicism in the United States flourished long before there were any Catholics in the United States. So you didn't need Catholics to have anti-Catholicism. Uh, you didn't need, uh, and you don't need many Muslims, at least, at least not of the political Islam uh, variety in the United States, to have uh, Islamophobia or discrimination against Muslims. And I think this has a lot more to do with the nature of American nationality than it does to do with Catholicism or Islam. Um, and perhaps it's really the weakness of American nationality uh, that requires, I think, um, <clears throat> that there's this thriving new genre of literature, kind of a cross-section of political science policy, history, a big history about why nations fail and why nations prosper. And, and <clears throat> one of the, it turns out, maybe not surprisingly, uh, big, the biggest reason nations fail is because they're crushed by their neighbors. Um, the United States uh, doesn't have uh, a serious geopolitical rival. Uh, it never has uh, for 250, maybe even years, maybe even longer. Uh, Canada and Mexico, both the places for sure, but they have never presented a kind of geopolitical or imperial challenge to the United States uh, imperial ambitions in North America. That just has to do with contingent historical reasons, and it's a fact. Um, so. My point uh, that I'd like to make is simply that well, most countries, most nationalities, and by nationality I just mean a feeling of belonging uh, to a political community. And the, the, the idea that the political community should be the same as the cultural community, that those two should, should congruent or, or, or be one and the same. Most nations uh, have territorial rivals, and most forms of nationalism uh, denigrate their territorial rivals. And this, in most cases, is based on long histories of animosity and competition, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, incorporation or colonization. That's not the case in the United States. <clears throat> so American nationality has no territorial rival, right? We're not afraid that the Canadians are going to take over. We're not afraid, well, I guess now we are afraid that the Mexicans <laughs> can take over. But we're not really, right? So we, so we know that's not actually going to happen. Um, as a result, uh, instead of a territorial rival, uh, the American nationality depends on ideological rivals or ideological enemies. Uh, and it's had a series of them throughout American history, uh, and this helps uh, Amer the American nation function. But this has more to do with the nature of the U.S. as a nation state than it does to do with uh, 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 Catholicism or Islam or even, I would say, communism. Um, if you look at the Cold War in the United States, yes, the Soviet Union was a genuinely, a genuinely rival alternative system by its own claims, by, by the claims of its promoters, with a real state and a real army. Um, but communism in the United States was, was um, I think, as one historian put it, about as popular as Buddhism in the Vatican, right? There weren't a lot of communists in the United States. There wasn't a communist political party in the United States that was threatening to take anything over. I don't think they've made a good showing at the polls in Ohio. Yet, for 50 years, American political culture was organized around crushing the supposed uh, foreign devil. Um, so, if you look at um, the question of religion and, and American national identity, from one perspective, I think what we can say is that uh, it needs a foreign devil. And we can look at a pretty clear and, and dramatic history of different foreign devils. For most of American history, it was Catholics. Uh, 
Then uh, for the second half of the 20th century, it was communist. Now, uh, it's Muslims. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts, right? I mean, these things don't go on forever, one hopes. Um, so, secondly, um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about something that also recurs throughout American history, uh, that I think is very important to American politics and American life. Uh, the political alliance between American evangelical Protestants and capitalists. Uh, this is, by many uh, measures, a very strange alliance. Uh, historically speaking, in the long view, capitalism destroys everything. Uh, it also creates everything anew and creates new things. But capitalism destroys the social bonds, the family structures, it certainly destroys patriarchy, and it certainly destroys the traditional sex roles uh, that evangelical Protestantism, uh, and we have no reason to doubt them, genuinely cherishes and seeks to promote in the political arena. <clears throat> um, yet, here we are, uh, recurring throughout at key moments in American history, with this very efficacious political alliance between evangelical Protestants and capitalists. Uh, the first time uh, they got together, they formed the American Missionary Movement, which is really an Anglo-American Missionary mo Movement because it was completely incorporated with the uh, British Protestant Missionary Movement. Uh, this is one of the inter truly interesting questions in history for which I don't myself have a really good answer. But if you read the, the, the thinkers and writers of the Protestant Reformation, if you read Luther and Calvin, uh, they talk a lot about converting the world to the missionaries. Uh, so they talk about, uh, as they would have said, the Mahomedans and the Hindus, um, and, and how they have to be converted, and how, how Christians, by which they meant Protestants and only Protestants, would, would convert them all and, 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 and deliver the world into the true, uh, in the literal sense, grace of God. Um, yet, Protestant missionary activity, um, and just will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, I have, I think uh, a strong argument can be made that there really is no significant Protestant missionary activity in the world until the early 19th century. That's obviously about 300 years uh, after the Protestant Reformation. So why does it take 300 years for the Protestants to actually become missionaries? Interesting question. I don't really know, have a, a completely convincing answer. But my point is, uh, that when they do so, it forms the first, uh, they do so with uh, the rising bourgeoisie of New York City, uh, and, and it forms uh, one of the, and the merchant uh, uh, maritime commerce class of London, uh, to form an Anglo-Protestant missionary movement that goes all over the world, the first really global Protestant missionary movement, and its alliance between evangelical Protestants uh, and Anglo-capitalists. Uh, the second time, um, just to show you that this is not a simple story, uh, is in some ways responsible for the end of slavery in the United States. In 1854, the founding of the Republican Party in Wisconsin is really founded, the Republican Party is really founded by Christians and capitalists. Uh, and they end up cooperating to, to, bring, to help bring about in a major way, in a major role in the end of slavery in America. Um, and then again, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, 1930s, really, I should say, and I think we're still in some long way in this moment, but Christians and capitalists unite in the 20th century, in the 1930s, to oppose the New Deal and to oppose the welfare state. I think this is where we still are today. Um, <clears throat> this seems to be where we still are today, right? These are kind of funny bedfellows, if you think about it, the Koch brothers, and and um, Franklin Graham and the other uh, evangelical Protestants who constitute what were repeatedly told and we think, right, as far as I know, the, the, the uh, uh, base of the current president of the United States, uh, highest turnout for uh, in support of, of Donald Trump of uh, any president in the last what, four years or so. Um, so, so um, why that alliance today? I mean, we're so used to it that it seems kind of, obviously you all know about it, it's familiar, but I, I want to point out that it's, 
kind of strange, too, uh, for the reason I mentioned. They don't necessarily, and in, and in some have the same interests uh, in many regards. They're certainly not the same kinds of people in many regards. Um, and I think I have a provisional answer for that that I just want to end with. Um, and I think it's that because there seems to be an understanding between, let's say, the Koch brothers uh, and Wall Street and the evangelical Protestants. There seems to be an understanding, which is largely, I haven't read it actually articulated anywhere, but that if you take away public goods, uh, if, if you just take them away, erode them, cancel them, the beneficiaries of that destruction of the welfare state of social programs uh, are going to include one, the very rich, uh, who can just pay for things themselves, right, uh, and Christians. And why Christians? And I think um, it's because Christians, unlike secular people, um, I'm generalizing here, so I'm happy to be told I'm wrong in specific instances, but I don't think I'm wrong in, in generality. Uh, Christians, especially evangelical Christians, and uh, uh, take care of people. They set up social programs, and I think one way we can see this very obviously demonstrated is in the difference between churches and universities, uh, especially the elite private universities. Ohio State, Madison, Indiana, these are a bit different, these are land-grant schools and, and are straight out of this public tradition that's quite distinct in some ways. Um, but churches, and this is true not just in churches of course, but with mosques, it's not true in Judaism, uh, they're generally considered the greater they are, uh, 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 the more people that come to them, right, it means they're more important, and the greater they are, the more members they have, the more influence they have, the more souls they save. Um, Whereas, if we take the great private universities as the kind of exemplary institutions of American secular values, and I think that's one reason why they play this weird role in American political culture, where we just, you, you can never read, uh, you never stop reading about uh, sort of silly controversies on campuses, especially elite kind of campuses, right? There's no other country that I'm aware of in the Western world where, like, who's invited to Berkeley? to Berkeley or their school, their, their uh, different colleges and universities, is consistently a dominant or predominant topic in the national news. It's a strange thing. And, and um, uh, but what is the, the difference with them and churches? There's many differences, but there's a fundamental one too. I think they're, they're fundamentally, in some ways, institutions of exclusion. Um, and uh, by that I mean, um, this is a my insight of formulation, as a woman, I can't remember, who was president of Evergreen State College in, in Washington, who pointed out that in all the ranking systems that we have for these schools, right, what's, what's the most important metric of uh, one of them? How many people, they, their low acceptance rate, so how many people they refuse to educate makes them better. The more people they refuse to educate, the better they are. The more people they refuse to hire, the better they are. And I think the opposite is true with churches. And, and I, I think that this inclusiveness of religious institutions uh, is, is uh, uh, something that merits a certain degree of respect, first of all, uh, and secondly, helps uh, us understand why they might stand to benefit in some ways uh, from the political alliance that is so conspicuous in the United States today. That's all right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Sam. What we have next is uh, Tisa Wender. Um, uh, Tisa is an associate professor of American religious history at Yale Divinity School. Her teaching and scholarship explore the cultural politics of religious freedom and the intersections of race, religion, and empire in U.S. history. Her first book, We Have a Religion, the 1920s Pueblo Indian Dance Controversy and American Religious Freedom shows how the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico deployed the concepts of religion and religious freedom to defend their ceremonial practices against government suppression. Her most recent book, this came out, and this is what she's been tweeting about, which is <laughs> uh, religious, so follow her. Uh, religious Freedom, the Contested History of an American Ideal, explores the significance of religious freedom for a variety of colonized and minority peoples. So, looking forward to what you have to say to you. So, please welcome her.
Victoria over lunch my profound ambivalence about Twitter, so I think that's why she's too bad. So I'll um, get you followed. <laughs> So it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here, and thanks to all of you for taking the time out um, on your Friday afternoon to come and be part of this conversation, and I really hope it can be a conversation um, among all of us. So the question posed to this panel was, uh, what role has religion played in the formation of American national identity? And um, I'm going to answer this in a little different way than Sam, but um, you know, it, it, we've we've been in conversation before, and I think our um, our approaches are fundamentally compatible. Um, they're not going to be big fireworks. I hope, if you were hoping for a big disagreement, <laughs> not going to happen. But um, you know, I I can't resist giving some response to the panel this morning, and I know that. Not everybody in the room was here for the panel this morning, so I apologize um, for that. But I think it does actually, they, um, some of my remarks will, will uh, connect and bridge the two conversations. So, um, you know, I, what I wanted to say, but I felt like I would have my turn. Um, in response to the, was to the conversation this morning on Islam and liberalism had to do with a kind of background characterization of Christianity as comfortably liberal, which I don't think is accurate, um, either historically or in the present. Um, nor do I think that liberalism is um, always benevolent. <laughs> or benevolent in, in, in every way. And that point was made in one way or another um, on the panel this morning, but, uh, but I'll, I'll make it in a different way this afternoon. So, um, you know, one example, so Locke and Lockean liberalism was um, invoked in the conversation, and I think it's easy for us to see Locke as this sort of pioneering founding father of religious liberty. And um, of course, that's a good thing. And we see that as um, you know, fixed and benevolent and um, equal and free for everybody. But you know, if you look at Locke himself, in fact, um, had an extremely limited and hierarchical vision of religious toleration uh, in which Catholics and atheists among others, there was no space for them. Right? They were not among those who were to be tolerated or free. As Sam was saying, you know, and Locke is moving us a little further back, but um, you know, in his view, they could not be trusted to be loyal citizens. And you know, this was not just a specter. And here's a point where I would differ slightly with Sam. Um, you know. There's, geo, there's a geopolitical context to that of um, imperial rivalries between Britain and France, in particular, in, 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 in Locke's day. And to say that there were no Catholics in early America, um, I mean, demographically in the British colonies, there were few, with the exception of, of Maryland. But these colonies are surrounded by French and Spanish imperial rivals, right? Which, so Catholicism was a real presence. And uh, um, there's this geopolitical con context of imperial rivalries that I think we have to see in order to understand the fears of Catholicism that, um, that were present in that early colonial period. Anyway, that was really about my, my talk, but I just can't just jump in there. So um, I, um, so I also, while I agree, and this here I'm moving into what I wanted to say this afternoon, while I certainly agree with Sam's initial point about um, you know America is the United States is not in any way founded as a Christian nation or a Protestant nation, and uh, legally certainly is not such, but nonetheless, um, 
Christianity and whiteness. And I want to bring race into the conversation, and I know Corey's going to um, do that in a little different way as well, but um, Christianity and whiteness have often been placed at the center of American national identity. And this has been contested. There have been competing strains throughout American history of what American national identity is, right? And, and the place of religion and the role of religion in that national identity. And, you know, so um, my husband just texted me this morning with all good wishes for the conference um, with the tidbit that he found on Wikipedia that um, Ohio's state model is, with God all things are possible, um, which the ACLU, a biblical motto that the ACLU has unsuccessfully challenged in court. Um, so for what that's worth, you know, the local uh, <laughs> color here in Ohio, but I think gives a sense of a uh, kind of founding role of Christianity in certain respects. In, um, in American law, right? Um, my own recent work, as Corey said in my introduction, has been on the history of religious freedom as an American ideal. And I've been interested not so much in what religious freedom means or what it should mean or in the legal history of religious freedom, but in what it does. Um, in other words, how different people have invoked this ideal and the cultural work that it has performed in American life. So one of the ways that religion shapes US national identity is through the idea of religious freedom, an idea that has long been a point of national pride and a key element of American exceptionalism. Um, to be an American in many narratives of American identity is to embrace religious freedom, to take pride in this freedom as a single contribution of the nation's founders to the world. Um, for some, although not all of those narratives, religious freedom also assumes a positive endorsement of religion, of religiosity, right, of being religious, um, and, and religious commitment, at least of certain kinds. And which kinds of religious commitment are within the bounds of good religion also shifts over time, right? Um, especially in Cold War versions of American exceptionalism, to be American was to be devoutly religious and uniquely free. And you know, Sam mentioned communism as a kind of you know ideological specter of uh, the enemy in that period, and absolutely that's the case. So the identity of America as religious, uniquely religious, and uniquely free was defined in opposition to public representations of Soviet atheism and totalitarianism. Um, many Americans today, especially those who identify with the Christian right, continue to place faith and freedom together at the heart of American national identity. Um, so I want to make three basic points. First, that the meaning of religious freedom in US history has always been hotly contested, and that continues today. It's a hot button issue. Um, and you know, that those contestations, they take their power, they're powerful because of how important this ideal is in American national identity, right? So lots of people want to um, attach themselves to it. Um, second, that controversies over religious freedom have shaped the contours of religion and what it means to be religious in American life. Um, and third, that these contests over religion, religion and religious freedom have been one of the places in which Americans work out what it means to be an American. They shape competing narratives and assumptions about who is really an American, um, American national identity. Historically um, and in the present, white Christians have often seen religious freedom and American identity as their own exclusive possession. Um, they have closely associated their whiteness and their Christianity with this freedom and with other freedoms. Um, and they've used these associations to locate themselves at the center of what it means to be an American. But this is never the end of the story. Um, minorities and dissenters and colonized people, and this is really what my book is about, have also 
avoid the language of religious freedom and the cultural authority of religion in American life to push back against those kind of white Christian nationalist versions of American identity and claim that identity for themselves. Um, so it won't be a big surprise to most people in this audience, I think, that religious freedom has always been contested. But I want to spell out a little bit what that means historically. Um, when the first US Congress debated and ratified the Bill of Rights, the clauses on religion represented a compromise between those who wanted to prevent federal interference in the established churches that many states maintained, and those who wanted to level the playing field by eliminating state support for all churches. But government authorities at the time applied religious freedom only unevenly to Catholics, Jews, not at all to Native American religious traditions or to the African-derived traditions practiced by many slaves. On an imperial landscape where religion mostly signified Christianity and was only starting to be used as a comparative category, indigenous and African traditions were barely considered to be religious at all. Um, these limits were racial as much as they were religious. Even for those slaves who were Christians, the promise of religious freedom like any other freedom was only a distant dream in a system that treated them as less than human and denied them any rights at all. But none of this stopped black people from claiming the right to religious freedom. Black abolitionists like David Walker in the 1830s placed the slave's right to this freedom at the heart of his anti-slavery appeal. In so doing, he was also asserting the full humanity of the people of African descent and with it their right to be fully American. The people who were devoutly religious, more authentically so, he said, and other black abolitionists said, than the hypocrites who had enslaved them and, um, and completely free. They had a right to be completely free. They were not. Um, in the early 1830s, Massachusetts and Connecticut became the last states to eliminate their formally established churches, still most states continue to privilege Christianity. So there's a legal privilege granted to Christianity despite you know, the truth of what Sam said about it not being founded as a Christian nation. Nonetheless, there's a legal and cultural privileging of Christianity in American um, life in this period and still in more subtle ways today, I would argue. Um, and often the dominant forms of white Protestant Christianity in particular, um, through prayers and Bible reading in the public schools, blasphemy laws, restrictions on who could serve on juries or hold public office, and much more, faced with protests from um, religious minorities, the powers that be actually defended these policies, sometimes in the name of religious freedom, the nation rested on Christian foundations, they argued, and this freedom meant, above all, that Christianity must be publicly honored and freely practiced. Um, in response, minority groups of all kinds, free thinkers, Jews, and Catholics among them, claimed religious freedom as their own and disputed the cultural authority of public Protestantism in its name. Um, so again, here's a kind of contestation over what religious freedom means, and through that contest, there's an argument about who's really an American, right? Um, some Protestants joined these protests, especially those like the Baptists, who had begun as dissenters against the established churches and the colonies, and remained committed to free church ideals. They believed the separation of church and state to be essential for their own churches and for every other religious group to thrive. Um, now, jumping forward in time to the middle of the 20th century, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's famous formulation of the four freedoms, including the freedom of worship, for which Americans should be prepared to fight in the Second World War, um, and following that, the Cold War emphasis on faith and freedom, these things brought renewed attention to the religious freedom ideal in the mid-20th century. Even as many US Christians called for a return to values that they believed all Americans should share, and the defenders of Jim Crow argued that racial segregation was divinely ordained, a part of the Southern religion that could not be violated. You know, again, all of these kinds of arguments are being made in the name of religious freedom. Religious freedom doesn't mean one thing, it means all 
all kinds of different things to all kinds of different people. Um, a diverse cast of <coughs> dissenters and minorities stress the rights and freedoms of individuals and minority groups instead using the Cold War rhetoric of faith and freedom. Um, through the tenacity of the civil liberties and civil rights movements in this period, this dissenting approach emerged victorious in the courts. By the 1970s, American courts and legislatures most often viewed the separation of church and state as a prerequisite <coughs> rather than a barrier to religious freedom. Jehovah's Witnesses won the right to proselytize in the streets. The Amish won the right to withhold their children from public schools on religious grounds. And the courts ruled that prayers and Bible readings could not be sponsored or mandated by officials in the public schools. Incarcerated people of many different racial and religious identities, most prominently um, black prisoners like Malcolm X, who joined the Nation of Islam, asserted their right to the free exercise of religion in the prisons. Um, in response, the emerging coalition of the Christian right turned religious freedom into its own rallying and cry. Um, and again, we see racial and religious identities working together here. Um, historian Randall Balmer has described how the evangelical right mobilized in the late 1970s against the IRS's withdrawal of tax exempt status from racially segregated private Christian schools, which they argued, Christian conservatives argued, ought to be free from state control and against the court decisions that limited state-sponsored prayer in the public schools. In other words, the white Christian right invoked this freedom, first of all, to defend embedded practices of racial discrimination and public Christianity against the legal victories of the civil rights movement. Um, in recent decades, the kind of Christian uh, right has used religious freedom in hot-button culture wars issues around gender and sexuality. If you're interested more in the history of those debates, I would highly recommend um, the book by Marguerite Griffith called Moral Combat, um, which has just, just come out and um, what we, why we view. All of these religious freedom disputes have worked, among other things, to negotiate what counts as religion and what it means to be religious in American life. Um, for example, white Protestant nativists in the late 19th century used the idea of religious freedom to argue for limits on Catholic immigration. Um, they contended that although they had no objection to Catholicism of its state and the proper bounds of religion, Roman Catholicism was essentially political and a serious threat to American democracy. So we hear similar voices today, and several people have made this point, Sam just made this a similar point. Um, arguing for a so-called so Muslim ban on the grounds that American democracy cannot survive the threat of quote-unquote political Islam, right? Um, in this discourse, the religious is defined in opposition to the political, which is construed as entirely spiritual and presumably private. This is a classic, to get back to the conversation point, a kind of classically liberal way of construing what religion is, which doesn't fit the kind of lived reality throughout most of, hi most of history of the, of the traditions that we call religious. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> uh, because of their allegedly political tendencies, first Catholicism and then Islam were said not to qualify. But this categorical exclusion is almost always selectively deployed against the other, often against the despised feared minority or outsider group. The Protestants who used it against this argument against Catholics had no qualms about wielding the power of the government themselves, seeking public office and passing legislation that imposed their own norms and standards on others. Um, much the same is true um, of the Christian right today. This opposition between the religious and the political, which is selectively applied, right, also worked historically to delegitimize colonized and racial minority groups whose religious movements often carry messages of liberation in this world as well as the world to come. Slaveholders and the law that supported them considered slave Christianity too dangerous. 
likely to spark slave revolts, a political distortion of what slaveholders considered to be a purely spiritual religion that focused on personal conversion, submission, and a racially ordered status quo. Um, and that, they said, was not political. Um, or consider the ghost dance movement, and now I'm going to move into my work in Native American um, history. Consider the ghost dance movement that spread rapid, rapidly in 1890 among Native Americans in the Western Mountains and Plains. This movement was grounded in the Paiute prophet Wobokas' message of future liberation from settler colonial violence and the traumas of reservation life. Alarmed white settlers and government agents, especially in South Dakota, feared the threat of Indian violence that they saw in this movement. Scholars writing about the ghost dance, as with many other prophetic movements in colonial contexts around the world, have fallen into the interpretive trap of replicating colonial discourse by categorizing it, such movements, as either religious or political. But this categorical distinction um, distorts the historical reality of colonized people whose religious movements spoke to the entirety of their lives. Even apparently sympathetic interpretations of such movements as legitimately religious, and so presumably not political, have served colonial interests by obscuring these lived realities and so um, analytically taming movements that often did involve protests against the colonial order. Um, building this uh, on the work of a graduate student at Yale who just finished last year and wrote her dissertation on historical interpretations of the ghost dance. Tiffany Hale. Look for her book. It's going to be terrific. Um, for much of U.S. history, government authorities simply did not consider religious freedom applicable, as I said, to indigenous practices and traditions, which they saw not as legitimately religious, but as forms of heathen or savage tyranny that enslaved Native people, or as in the ghost dance that allegedly whipped them into a frenzy of savage violence. Um, Native people constantly pushed back against this logic, ghost dance leaders argued that their movement was indeed religious, the Indian way of following the great spirit, and they too must be granted the right of religious freedom. But in being forced to make that kind of argument as well, there's a kind of disciplining mechanism in the logic of religious freedom that makes them um, pull back against anti -colonial, the anti-colonial implications of the movement to say, no, 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 we're just religious, really, you know, uh, as a defense against government suppression, violent suppression, which in fact happened of the ghost dance, right? Um, so this, these arguments serve as a disciplinary measure for Native movements that had to look more like Christianity if they were to, and, and, and had to look peaceful, had to look like they were about um, being civilized and, um, if they were to have a hope of gaining acceptance as religion. In the case of the ghost dance, this appeal failed. And after the massacre uh, at Wounded Knee, federal agents tried to suppress the movement all across Indian country. Still, gradually, some native claims to religious freedom began to succeed. By the mid-1930s, the US government granted a degree of legitimacy to native ceremonies and traditions under the rubric of religious freedom. Native American demands for religious freedom were a plea to be considered legitimately religious and ultimately um, had some success in expanding the scope of what could count as religion under U.S. law. But Native American traditions never really fit into those legal frameworks. Consider the sacred land cases that went to the courts in the 1980s and 1990s, especially in one case after another, the rubric of religious freedom, First Amendment appeals, um, failed to protect important Native American sites. Even when Supreme Court justices explicitly recognized Native traditions as religious under a legal regime that categorizes land as property, right? Property rights have preeminence. <laughs> um, and consistently prioritizes the rights of private property and big corporations they have not been the kind of religion that the First Amendment could protect. The urgency of this issue has only increased under the current administration. Last year's Native protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline 
argued, among other things, that the pipeline would violate the purity of the water in a way that threatened um, Sioux spiritual practices and other native spiritual practices. These claims went nowhere for the pipeline project moved forward. Um, these claims were made in conjunction with other kinds of claims, of course, around tribal sovereignty, um, environmental interests, all kinds of things. None of them were successful. Um, more recently, President Trump announced the plans to dramatically reduce the amount of land included in the Bear Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments in Utah. Um, as in the pipeline case, the land affected by the change has religious significance to a number of Native American nations who originated the efforts to create the Bear Ears National Monument decades ago and spoke out against the change. A huge tribal leader expressed his concern that the reduction could damage the land's historical and religious integrity. Despite legal challenges, the Bureau of Land Management has drafted plans to move forward with the reorganization of the Bear Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante land. These are some of the limits of American religious freedom and what really counts as religion, which is structured around fundamentally Christian understandings of what religion is, right? Um, when in the United States today. Um, Trump's executive order on religious liberty issued last May did not have these Native American religious freedom appeals in mind. Um, it, for his purposes, they do not count as religious. Nor are his administration and their supporters interested in the religious freedom appeals advanced in recent years by American Muslims or by progressive churches who uh, are working to protect undocumented immigrants in the sanctuary movement and make religious freedom appeals, but those don't have any traction under the vaunted uh, you know, religious freedom executive order or um, even much in the press. Just last week, the Trump administration, sorry to get so political here, I can't you know, go there. Um, <laughs> the Trump administration created a new conscience and religious freedom division within the Department of Health and Human Services. I don't know if everybody heard this news. It kind of, there's so much going on. It kind of, I think, went under the radar to some extent. Um, this new conscience and religious freedom division within the Department of Health and Human Services was charged specifically with protecting the rights of doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who claim religious objections to contraception, abortion, or other hot button issues for the contemporary Christian right. In the current rhetorics of that Christian right, and in the broader public discourse that often accepts its terms, religious freedom refers almost entirely to this set of issues around gender and sexuality, and not to a much broader field of religious minorities like Native people, like immigrants, whose rights, whether you want to consider them religious or not, you know, <laughs> are being violated. And, and people in those communities are attempting to defend them on themselves on religious freedom terms. Um, so in effect, this set of issues around gender and sexuality, um, which is of concern to one set of um, you know, conservative Christians, defines what is religious freedom, and so what is really religion in American life, in American politics today? What's really um, seen as such, given attention as such? So all of these controversies I'm just about done here, um, over religious freedom have also been an arena for contests over American national identity. This is kind of the thread that I've been pulling throughout here over what it means to be an American, who gets identified as a normative um, American. Religious freedom talk on the white nationalist Christian right, um, which has often identified this ideal in almost entirely with whiteness as well as Christianity. And you, you can um, see those claims in 19th century white Christian nationalists. 19th century white Christian nationalists are by no means the same as our contemporary 21st century brand, but they have this in common. <laughs> well, they uh, both will explicitly make claims that religious freedom comes from Christianity and that um, Today, they're less likely to explicitly say, as they did in the 19th century, that white people uh, were racially more equipped for freedom. Uh, but uh, those 
claims have worked to reinforce the limited and exclusive formations of who counts as an American. Um, I was kind of um, surprised on the panel this morning to hear Shadi say that there's no ethno um, religious nationalism in the United States uh, because while you know I'm delighted to know that n not everybody feels limited by that it, it you know this is it's a huge issue right now right this is hotly contested whether American national identity is whether whiteness and Christianity are at the center of American national identity or not. This is, what's, this is the fight that's happening in our contemporary political world, right? It, that's, that's not settled. <laughs> it's still happening. It's still an argument. Um, so uh, minorities, you know, even as those claims are being advanced, sometimes in the name of religious freedom, um, as I've also tried to point out, so minorities of all kinds have used their um, protests and their voices and have also claimed that language of religious freedom to identify themselves also as fully American and to redefine American national identity in more inclusive ways. So I'm done. Thank you and I look forward to your conversation. sociology here and um, look, I'm so excited that we're doing these kinds of things here on OSU's campus, uh, making religion much more central to our scholarship and our discussion. So thank you to you, Eric. Much appreciated. Uh, so um, I want to thank you, Tisa and Sam, again, for your engaging presentations. They really provided us for a lot of food for thought, I think. And as Tisa said, I really look forward to building on these ideas during our discussion time. Um, I'm going to briefly touch upon a few ideas here stemming from my own scholarship on race, ethnicity, and religion. And I'm going to consider the limitations and opportunities of religion for addressing racial injustice in our contemporary era in America. What makes this contemporary era, which I consider to be post-civil rights era, different from other eras, is that overt racial prejudice is for the most part, is for the most part, part thought to be taboo, even though in recent uh, times here we see these emergences of blatant white racism. Another thing that we see is that multiculturalism is in. Right? I mean, nearly every major institution affirms, at least in word, if not in deed, diversity. And this is quite a turn of the tide when it comes to formal institutional policies, considering that the race, that racial segregation quite frankly, is simply taken for granted and has been taken for granted as just normative for so long, such a long part of our history. Religion actually is no exception here. Racial segregation among religious organizations has been and continues to be just how religion is done in the U.S. And we also know that there have been and continue to be fiercely opposing positions on the role of religion in the matters of racial justice. It seems, though, that after the civil rights movement, many religious practitioners and institutions, especially those thought to be mainstream, decided it was time to put all that systemic justice stuff aside, and as with other institutions in this new era, deal with racial injustice by promoting racial diversity. Scholars in the last decade or so, including myself, got interested in understanding this move toward racial diversity in religious organizations, mainly churches. The more common explanation presented is a variation of what social psychologists refer to as the process of forming superordinate identities. That is by placing greater emphases and importance on a common identity of some sort that members share, while at the same time minimizing the importance of racial identities, which highlight differences among members, that multiracial religious organizations can be developed and sustained. 
The second thread of research in this area says that multiracial religious organizations really can't be understood apart from the larger racialized context in which they are located. And this is actually where my work is situated. In my book, The Elusive Dream, I argue, drawing upon critical whiteness theory, that multiracial congregations work to the extent that they are comfortable for white people. One of the underlying assumptions, though, of a good deal of scholarship on multiracial congregations, but by no means all, but a good deal of it assumes that bringing people of different racial backgrounds together to worship in a congregational setting has the potential to alleviate racial inequality. The idea is that interracial bonds can form in the context of a multiracial church. They can be informative and change how people see race. From here, what has been suggested is that once people move to forming close interracial bonds within the context of multiracial congregations, there is the possibility of these bonds acting as a conduit for transmitting valuable social and material resources. And this matters because we know that there's a good deal of racial socioeconomic inequality in the U.S. And so in this way, multiracial churches can work, can work to reduce inequality. Religion then becomes an institution where the resources of whites are not just benefiting them, but people of color. The challenge here is that research also shows that, at least among Protestants, blacks and whites have strikingly different cultural toolkits for understanding the world and how their faith ought to be understood and practiced. Further, research suggests that white people, even supposedly well-meaning white Christians, are particularly invested, as he's already highlighted, in maintaining the privileges associated with their whiteness. And so the question begs, under what circumstances could truly inclusive and egalitarian multicultural congregations, or at least Christian ones, develop? Well, racially diverse churches have, by and large, not really demonstrated great potential for dealing with racial inequality. There, there just isn't really strong evidence for that. But fear not. All is not lost. I've already, what we've already talked about, Tisa touched upon some of this in some ways, that we've seen the abolitionist and the civil rights movement, which drew upon moral frameworks, uh, community and social networks of religious people, and organizations to mobilize for racial justice. Uh, religion in America does, in fact, offer a useful structural and cultural apparatus for addressing systemic social problems. And its usefulness is in large part due to its separation from the state or its idea of religious freedom. Moreover, I suggest that religious racial segregation actually is in some ways still necessary if religion is going to be instru instrumental in the reduction of racial injustice. I, along with the assistance of a PhD student colleague at the time, Michelle Alcala, she just finished uh, her, her doctoral degree, um, she and I did a study here in Ohio where we began to examine the civic and political engagement of black religious leaders in the state back in 2012 when Obama was up for re-election. I was able to see in that, in that moment the potential for mobilization among racially segregated religious networks and the get-out-the-vote efforts of black religious leaders at that moment. Now, you might recall, Ohio, like many of the other battleground states run by Republicans, attempted to change early voting opportunities in a way that threatened to negatively and disproportionately affect the turnout of voters who tend to vote Democratic. At one black denominational conference I observed, the attempts by Ohio's Republican Secretary of State were framed as a means to disenfranchise the black vote. One woman led those in attendance in a song she and a fellow church member wrote to the tune of the Negro spiritual, Let My People Go. The first verse and chorus went like this, and so I'm going to ask you at the moment to please bear with me. I'm going to attempt to sing this a cappella, so I want you to try to get the, the, the feel of it. <clears throat> when Satan tried to block our way, let my people vote. A voice he tried to take away. Let my people vote. Go down to the polls in Ohio. Tell those fellows to let my people vote. Black religious leaders work. <laughs> My point 
point is that the black religious leaders and the people that were following in these churches, they worked many quite tirelessly to get black voters to the polls. They participated in a variety of activities in the get out the vote effort. Almost all the black pastors interviewed for the project said that they made sure to regularly remind their attendees during Sunday services, some for months prior to the election, to register to vote and vote early. And it didn't stop there. A majority facilitated voter registration, setting up tables in church lobbies. Several black religious leaders made transportation available so people at the church and in the neighborhood surrounding the church could get to their county boards of elections to register and vote early. Across the state, a campaign known as Souls to the Polls was underway the Sunday before Election Day, which was aimed to get people to vote early. Black religious leaders organized church and community members to pass on more than 10,000 flyers with voter registration information and early voting locations and hours before the election. Frankly, it's difficult to imagine religious leaders of multiracial churches, the vast majority of whom are white, taking such strong offense to the changes to voting opportunities in Ohio, and then spending this degree of energy to mobilize voters of color. <coughs> so what is the role of religion for addressing racial injustice in this contemporary era? I touched upon the example of Ohio black religious leaders who, through racially segregated networks, were able to mobilize people to get out and vote. And by the way, it appears their efforts worked. In 2008, the black turnout comprised 11% of voters in Ohio. In 2012, it was 15%. President Obama would not have won Ohio in 2012 if the proportion of the black turnout in Ohio equaled that of 2008. But that was voted. What about the criminalization and high incarceration, high incarceration rates of blacks and Latinos? Or the high rates of poverty among people of color? Can religious leaders, can religious leaders of color do much to address these injustices today? Recent data suggests that the proportion of multiracial congregations is increasing. 13% of them, of religious organizations, are now racially diverse. That's a jump of almost 75% over a decade. Much of this growth is among mega churches. If multiracial churches, by and large, are reinforcing the racial status quo, as research suggests they do, then they may be doing more to hurt, not help, racial inequality. And what if this growth is a result of people of color leaving congregations of color for multiracial churches? When they do that, they're taking their resources, their time, their, their understanding, their social con connections, their money with them. And this doesn't bode well for the leaders of congregations of color that want to mobilize for racial justice. Religion as a structure has and still can be employed to address issues of racial inequality and injustice. In this contemporary era, though, we're dealing with racism head on as taboo, and multiculturalism, not racial justice, is the central goal of religious institutions, even all institutions. It quite remains unclear the extent to which religion in America will continue to be used to do so. Thank you. Um, instead of me starting off, I'm going to start off just a few snowball thoughts. No one has to pick up on them. It's just to kind of get the ball rolling. If you have something to say, it's totally fine. I think that um, I'm just going to throw out uh, a couple ideas. And the thing that comes to me in, our, in all of our discussions um, so far is um, this idea of who gets access to the bounty that is America. Who gets to be American and who gets to be a part and who gets to get the resources of it. And then what role does religion play uh, in that? It's, in some ways, what I'm hearing throughout. But again, this is an idea, and then if you guys have something to okay.
with what we consider American teams and like a teenager struggling between child and adult. That is what it is to be teen and so it is to be American. Um, I just, I can start off and I just, like, I this is kind of another question I had, so we'll just kind of go with it. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think one of the things that stands out to me is, is what it means to be American, is that really uh, clearly articulated, or is what we're articulating what it means to not be American? And I'm not, and there's something really powerful, if you look in scholarship, um, whether it's in race scholarship, or gender scholarship, or sexuality scholarship, or scholarship of uh, class, there's something really powerful about actually not naming the, the normative group, but just naming the group that's not normative. And so um, I think that's a really good point. And, I, and actually, I would love to hear what you all think about that. Well, I, I would respond, I think, very quickly just by saying that to some extent, this is how the formation of collective identities works, you know? <laughs> uh, both in terms of what that identity is, tested, and to some extent defined against outsiders, right? We can see that in different ways in looking at all kinds of different human groups. Um, so, it's, so it's hard, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine the debate over what American identity is. I mean, I think that, that, that debate over American identity what American identity is takes distinctive forms for a whole variety of historical reasons, right, about uh, how the United States came to be as a settler colonial society. You know? um, but, but it's not, it's not, it, it, I, it's impossible for me to imagine that going away. I mean, it's going to change shape. It's inevitably going to change form. You know, the, the kind of hot button issues of the day, or who's construed as the enemy, the other, um, by some, is going to change over time. But identities and traditions change, and they draw, they re-narrate their own histories as they change. I, I agree with what, what uh, just what the court said. I don't have anything. Society has sort of become 
bless you, just I'm not sure about that. So you said there's talk about millennials ruining everything. I've been hoping millennials will save everything. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, you know, the kind of studies or the, the data that show millennials being less religious in conventional terms, you know, I guess as a historian, I mean, I don't, I, 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 historians are famously bad at predicting the future, right? And I, I, but it's hard to say, I also see cycles in U.S. history, and I don't, um, and I see sort of religious configurations and commitments shifting over time, and to some extent it's normal for kind of younger generations to fall away from religious commitments and then maybe come back later or for a new generation to kind of rediscover religious commitments. So it, that, that has happened over and over again. So whether this is a permanent trend is hard to say, right? Um, but I think, and I don't have any data to back this up, but it's my sense that at least for some millennials, one reason for sort of um, becoming suspicious or cynical of religious institutions is precisely the association of um, so much of kind of Christianity with the um, with the right with right wing politics these days. Um, so, in that sense, if millennials are if if I'm right that millennials are rejecting that, and it's, uh, then maybe that is a way for millennials to say everything <laughs> from my own point of view. I think the baby boomers ruined everything. <laughs> <laughs> in line with mine. <laughs> Thank you. I was just wondering um, what the work of religious freedom is doing in some of these rights, um, you know, these contentions for like rights. So I mean one of the sort of Tisa, you're um, the thinking about the Native or like Native American sort of to their environmental rights, there's like rights to water, right? Yeah. There's and then there's like the right to like freedom of religion, right? And why go to the sort of religious freedom when these rights are sort of co, like they, they, you can, there ain't, there are different angles to get to them. So what is, what is the sort of religion doing there? Like, is it adding anything to the demands for certain, um, certain changes in the state? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think the best answer I can give is that um, political m movements are necessarily strategic and improvisational, <laughs> right? And so, to some extent, you see Native communities and Native activists casting about for an argument that will catch, that will work, <laughs> you know? And if, because religious freedom has this kind of cultural power and cachet, that's what, um, and because there was an American Indian Religious Freedom Act that was supposed to specifically protect Native American religious freedom, you know, that was passed by Congress and, you know, ended up in reality doing very little in, 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 in doing, uh, rarely working when actual Native people tried to claim their rights under that law as well as under the First Amendment, right, rarely succeeded. Um, but because of that legal structure, because of the kind of cultural power of, um, of religious freedom, that is one place that they turn and kind of configure and frame their appeals in those terms. But it's certainly not the only way that they do so. They're kind of using a, an a array of legal strategies. I talk with my hands too much. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
So I wanted to go back to Professor uh, Eshelby who started by talking about uh, a lot, the curious alliance you described between Christians and Catholics. And I'm wondering whether we're talking about an alliance of white Christians and Catholics. Yes. And, <laughs> and so it does seem to me that, and I'm just wondering, picture in my head corresponds to the more historically important picture of Europe, which is that this alliance, these alliances can be different motivated at different times. And I mean right now, and again this may be quite oversimplified, but I do see it as uh, a kind of marriage of people who don't want to pay for public goods and uh, people who want the right to exclude others. And so, you know, we're it's okay to defund public institutions because I don't want my kids to go there, and it's okay to defund them because I don't need them. So I'm sending my kids to Davos. Um, and if there's something more complicated going on, and I'm sure there is, what's, what's more complicated? <laughs> um, there's a couple different iterations of this alliance. Yes, of course, your point is well taken. It, it is white Christians and Catholics. African American Christianity has a different political orientation, generally speaking, to be sure. Uh, so there's a couple of different iterations historically between the early, late, and the 19th century and 20th century. But I think presently it is a little bit more complicated, uh, simply for the fact that. Uh, um, they're not the all the, the, the Christians' interest in the alliance is not, they're not simply excluding. I think in other ways they're very inclusive, much more inclusive than liberals. And I think liberals in the Democratic Party are also in uh, different venues in society, very exclusion. So I, I don't think that they, uh, um, um, I think there are different moral judgments we can make about the forms of exclusion taken. I do that and people do that differently. but. I don't think it's so simple as uh, 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 them wanting to exclude and liberals wanting to include. Liberals are very exclusive people in many ways. But I don't think it's so. Um, <coughs> I'd make it say more, if I, but I, that's the basic way I would be asking if that's simple. And why, that's why I think it's not quite that simple. I don't know if I can build on that a little bit. Um, Scholarship suggestion is kind of interesting, and I was talking about my work that deals with stuff about diversity. And you're going to find, um, so to your point, that conservative Protestant um, churches are are more likely to be diverse than, than mainline or liberal churches, by far. Um, and so there's different ways to exclude. So you can exclude through, uh, you can be very directly exclusive, you know, and saying things that put that make people feel excluded, or you can exclude, as I was already mentioning, through hegemonic structures, which are things that are unspoken, just the way in which we go about do, doing things that do not that make it difficult for people to be a part of it. I think in the case of the mainline Protestantism, that can be a problem. The way in which mainline Protestantism is done, it's actually not a very inclusive structure for people who are not white, and then people who are not educated, highly educated, and of a particular class. So, there's, so to your point, there's various ways of excluding, and I think you're right, it's about what you consider more moral than that. So I actually wanted to just pose a couple questions. If other people don't have any, I'm going to make um, and I'd love to hear what you all, uh, Sam and Tisa, think about. Um, well, let me ask it this way. Um, we know, for example, you guys, I think both of you kind of touch upon this, that white evangelicals voted for Trump, the overwhelming number. Um, but really, the surprise is not that they voted Republican, but that they, that they voted for Trump. That's the big surprise. <laughs> As my comments suggest, I, a question I'm grappling with now is essentially to religion still in this contemporary era can be used to challenge or disrupt religious, racial, gender, class identities, and so on. Um, to what extent do you, have any, do you think that's possible with that? So, given your historical work and your thoughts like that. Um, can you ask for more time just so I can invite a minute to, to, to answer that? Yeah. 
and the assimilation processes, and it really a, a lot of it. Uh, while you you're suggesting that that groups have a good deal of agency to make these decisions about the extent to which they're going to either maintain an identity and, and own that, or um, assimilate into the into the broader society. And of course, the people, individuals have agency, and groups have agency. Um, the challenge is it really just varies on the kinds of opportunities and resources that different groups have. I mean, uh, so for example, is this a group largely comprised of people who are undocumented or not? That right there is going to have a fundamental impact on the extent to which the group, an individual, will want to move towards assimilation, assimilating a field they can or not, um, or even the group will want to move towards assimilation or not. Uh, some other, other scholarship talks about just the extent to what kinds of relationships does the home, this host country, that would be the U.S., has with the home country. Are those good relationships? And depending on whether those are contentious relationships or not, or um, amicable relationships or not, then that gives a group greater choices, broader choices to make. So I think the extent, there are just very real um, consequences for making the choice. I went back to this point about, you know, you groups um, contain and cord and keep resources, and if you want the resources of that group, and in this case we're talking about whatever it is to be that American group, you may have the group or individuals will have to make some choices. It's just group dynamics about whether or not you want to get access to that. Um, and if you maintain your identity or if you feel like you or there are options that just don't have that option. That really depends on the relationships that are going on within the country. So um, if those a bunch of different factors are a part of that. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. It's good answer. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we uh, we have actually passed our time. Thank I want to thank uh, Tim Tisa for being with us today. Thank you.